my, my wonderful students. Uh, let me apologize. Uh, for those of you that, that didn't get up in time uh, to get your printout, it's not like we're trying to be an SOB, uh, which I, by nature, am actually an SOB, a son of a Brickner. Uh, but we, we have a zillion of these printouts to go through. And so we just go through the, lit, through the pile once. And if you can get up on time, um, you can have it. And if you don't get up there before we pass to the next two or three people, you're going to have to wait till after lecture. And usually we'll have a few minutes after lecture. So don't worry about, um, you know, being a few minutes late. Even if I give you the business about being a slacker, I don't really mean it. And uh, so you're going to get your printout. So don't worry about that. Uh, I want to talk about these printouts for a few minutes, uh, but before we do that, uh, let me just reinforce, uh, here's our quotation for the day, um, SI schedule is running, normal uh, schedule this week uh, for, your, for your SI studying pleasure, and I have a public service announcement uh, for those of you that got breached, if you um, are a person, a student at UCF that got your uh, credential, your social security stolen, uh, raise your hand if you got that letter. I got one. Okay. So for those of you, you might not have it yet or you might not have checked your mail, but if you do, I want to go through some basic information uh, for you, and I've actually been through this once before. All right, so go ahead and write down this uh, website address, irs.gov slash UAC slash taxpayer dash guide dash two dash identity dash theft. And if you go to that website, you'll see the, inst this is basically a cut and paste uh, from what the IRS website says. First of all, you file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission at identitytheft.gov. And then contact one of the three major credit bureaus. And this actually happened to me a year ago, although I didn't find out about it until June. Uh, when I filed my income tax refund and I had to call up Experian and any of those guys all you have to do is one and then that one that you contact will um, also contact the other two so you just got to call one of these guys and place a fraud alert it's not hard uh, but it's very helpful and then contact your bank and other financial institutions and double check your accounts of course make sure that nobody's tried to hack into it, um, let me go back to that, uh, and just, uh, you know, try to get all that stuff uh, done. And this website address up here is a good place to go. Now, if you, and, and Darian unfortunately got hacked, I got hacked, and a bunch of you have gotten hacked, and what they got was not, a, not credit card information or debit card or anything, but your social security number. And with that, they can actually file an income tax return and get money from the government. All right, and that's what happened to me last year. And I don't want it to happen to you. So uh, this applies to you. If, if your SSN, social security number, is compromised and you know or suspect you're a victim of tax-related identity theft, here's the additional steps that IRS recommends. Uh, respond immediately to any... Uh, mailing that you get from IRS um, and, uh, or go to idverify.irs.gov. Um, and then if, you're, if you actually have been, th th I had to do this. I had to file an affidavit of identity theft. And I, you know, I had to do that last summer. And hopefully none of you guys will have to. But if you have to, this is you know, the procedure that they recommend. And just to re-verify 
um, you have to, you still have to pay your taxes. So they don't let the, you know they try to help you out, but they don't let you off the hook. You still got to pay. Anyway, um, this is the website down here in yellow. I'll try to jot jot that down if nothing else. And if you have a, a roommate that's in that situation, God forbid, uh, you'll know what to tell them. Okay, and so my last uh, admonition to you is um, hang in there and try to do the, especially the fraud alert, uh, that'll head off uh, crooks, head them off at the pass, so to speak. And then talk to the IRS, which is not pleasant, but you got to do it in this case. And then if you find the guy that did it, just give him the Iron Man treatment, you know, so. All right, so that's my public service announcement. And uh, hopefully you can get working on that. Okay, exam one comments. Comments. We just got the exam printouts back. We handed them to you. And I haven't, I don't know what the average is yet. On the Scantrons, I haven't analyzed it yet. We just got them back this morning, about 20 minutes ago. So we're still analyzing it. What you have is a printout with your performance on the Scantron. All right, so this, uh, this printout that you have, it lists all the different answers you bubbled in for 45 questions. Now, the test scoring service, they don't know anything about the clicking that we did. I know about it. It is posted in web courses in your grades page. Uh, so you know about it. And the way that you handle it is this score, the raw score here, is accurate. The printout percentage, uh, let's see, up at the upper right, it says percentage score, and it might be 53 or 74 or whatever it is. Uh, that is incorrect, but the raw score and the total points in the upper right corner, uh, those are accurate. Now, you add that to whatever you got from iClicker, and that's already up in web courses on your grades page, and you add those two numbers, uh, and uh, that'll be your total exam one score. So however many points you have on this, plus whatever is in your uh, grades page for your clicker, and that's how many you have out of 50 on exam one. Now, I'm going to do that for you as soon as I, um, probably tonight, when I get a chance to unmute your scores. Right now, all your Scantron scores are in web courses, but I have it on mute uh, so that you cannot see them uh, and I usually do that until I hand back the scan, the printouts. I've done that. Uh, Darian and Caroline have helped do that. So we are squared away, uh, and I will unmute those scores uh, ASAP. Now, if you have a minus one in the clicking column or in the uh, Scantron, exam one Scantron uh, row of your grades page, then that means that we didn't get any data from you, okay? And so the students, so right now there's a handful of students that don't have a grade because they didn't bubble in the test form. And there's a couple students that got a printout but they didn't get a, a grade in web courses uh, for the Scantron because uh, they, didn't, uh, they, they messed up their PID. So those guys have minus ones. If you're absent, the Scantron will also read as a minus one, and so will the eye clicker. And so if you're absent for the test, you know, which I know a few people have been, um, you'll have minus ones. So it's not like I'm taking away points. That's just to symbolize that there's no grade for you in that one. It means you've been absent or something went wrong with your Scantron or something. All right? Uh, now, one thing I want you to look at right now and that is there's two kinds of bubbling errors that the Scantron is prone to. And one of them is no answer, a blank. Now, if you have your printout, 
you'll be able to see it. They'll actually print out the word blank if you forgot to bubble something in. But the problem is, it'll also put in the number, it, the word blank if you didn't bubble it in dark enough. All right? So look for the, wor for the word blank. And then also look for slots here where you have two answers. Okay? In the column that says student, that's you. If you have two um, letters, you know, A and C or something like that, that means that you bubbled in something, you tried to erase it, and you bubbled in another one, but your erasure wasn't good enough. It looks like two bubbles were bubbled in, and that's automatically wrong. Now, we can correct that if you give us your Scantrons back, and, and Darian and, and Caroline will dig through the pile and see if you really do have two dots bubbled in. Or if you erased one and it's obviously erased, we can correct that. So raise your hand if you have any blanks. Anybody have a blank? Okay. A few of you have blanks. I want you to bring your papers right up here. Give them to Darian right now. We'll just take a minute to do that. All right. And we'll try to get these back to you at the end of class. If not, uh, then on Thursday. All right. And you kind of know where you are now. All right, raise your hand if you have any double answers. You bubbled in two. So look at your exam, your printout really carefully. Okay? Right? And see if you have two. Anybody have two answers? Okay, that's good. Can you, um, Darian and Caroline, can you guys? Okay, this guy's on top. Can you? Uh, Caroline, can you look through these ones that haven't been handed back mm -hmm. to see if there's blanks or doubles? Okay. And then here's the scantrons, and you can double check. And you know how to use the serial number, right? That's this little faint number down on the mm -hmm. down on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you should be able to dig them out fairly easily. Okay. And so you do the – you can sit over there if you like. Yeah. Uh, or you sit, you know, wherever you want. Okay. And we'll try to get those – Whoa, my earphone fell out. Uh, we'll try to get those uh, squared away for you uh, this hour, and hopefully we'll get those back to you. Yeah? Recording for SI on Thursday. That is Miss Shy, and she published the link for that. But Shy, I was not able to get in on that link. Yeah, what's your password? Opal, capital O P, capitals, all caps. But that's in the discussion area, isn't it? You're the posting, same password. Okay, me was shy after class, you know, and she'll she'll get you squared away. Does does the recording work? Because I tried to look. Uh, has anybody tried the recording for that SI session? Yeah, it's new technology for shy, so we're tr she's trying to work out the kinks. I've done it a million times, but. Uh, she, being a rookie, she's, we'll, we'll get it squared away though. Chop, chop. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Um, I want to talk about exam blurbs, which is a big topic for us. If you look in uh, web courses, you'll see um, a link for the exam blurbs page, which looks like this. And um, here's a close-up of it. Uh, right now, I have a blurb file set up for the clicking questions. It's a PDF file. Uh, and I will have a blurb file for the Scantron portion of the exam. And you'll be able to look at, you know, whatever exam form you have, test form A, B, C, or D, and look at the blurb file. And basically what the blurb file does, it tells you um, about each question. Um, so, like, number 17 might have been uh, Newton's second law calculation. And so if you got number 17 wrong, which you can know by looking at your printout, um, you'll be able to identify the questions that you got wrong. Okay, and then you can... Uh, and so if you got number 17 wrong and it says uh, Newton's second law, you know, okay, for the final exam... I better make sure I do a little extra study 
for Newton's second law. And you can do that for every question. You can do it for every question on the test, and especially for the ones that you got incorrect. So this printout that you've got, together with the blurb files, will make a nice little uh, study guide for the final. And uh, there's, as I ha indicate here, there's a blurb sheet already going for the clicking questions. Unfortunately, I cannot publish your actual clicking um, data. In other words, what you actually typed in for your answer. I can see it, but I, Canvas doesn't allow uh, anybody to publish that kind of thing. It, it's Canvas's way or the highway, unfortunately. So, um, but you can at least look at the blurb file, and you can see what grade you got. You know how many points you got. And by the way, um, there were two two-point calculations, and then there was a one, a single one-point multiple choice question. Um, so you could get anywhere from zero to five on that. And I did award partial credit for some individuals. I looked at everybody's scores very carefully, all 200 and something of you, and that, that actually clicked something in. And I spotted some, some answers that I thought, okay, I'll give them. Like a couple people uh, forgot a decimal point, obviously. They put it in the wrong place or something like that. And that decimal point is a pain in the neck. Uh, some people put an equal sign instead of a minus sign. Because uh, it's hard to tell apart. Uh, so I tried to, and I can spot that. The computer can't spot that, but I can spot it. Uh, and so that's why I, always, I, I love the clicking questions because I can give partial credit. You know, Scantron doesn't know Jack. You know, Scantron, they just look for the dots. And if the dot is there, you get it. If it's not there, you don't get it. But I can look at the data that you, that you type in and give partial credit for that. Okay, questions about your exam printout and stuff like that. Uh, the question up front here was, did anybody get 100? And the answer to that is, I think one person did. So it's pretty tough to do, especially the first test. Uh, and there wasn't any bonus points, so they got every single point that they could get, 50 out of 50. I think it was one person. Question, Brittany. Good question. Uh, Brittany's question was, will the exams be cumulative? Uh, in other words, will we keep using concepts from this test on future tests? And the answer to that is yes. I mean, we're never, think about it this way, we're never going to stop talking about Newton's laws of motion. They're always going to be somewhere in the conversation. So, and so that we, we say that the exam, the final exam is cumulative, but really... Uh, every exam is building on the previous, and so, you know, there'll be new topics, and so it won't all be as intense um, about Newton's second law as this one was. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, some of the things we're just going to, energy, when we talk about energy in the next week, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about that till the cows come home. So, another question. Yeah, go ahead. The question is, are the grades in web courses, like the percentages that it gives you, are those accurate? And the answer to that is gigantic. No. No way, Jose. They're completely close. And it has nothing to do with our grade scheme. I haven't made a grade scheme in web courses. They don't know about, you know, 85% performance for clicking. You know, they don't know anything about, all they know about is our homework and anything that I put in for an exam, which we have now. But they, they don't know how I put it all together at the end of the semester. So if you see a percentage in there, ignore it. Okay? Don't even ask me about it. And, and the reason, you, I, 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 you know, it's not like I'm going to yell at you or anything, but you got them all squared away? Good. Okay, those are... That's all the blanks, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, did anybody change? Okay. All right. So you guys that had blanks, you actually did have blanks. 
Nobody had any changes. But we'll give you your exams back, your printouts back at the end of class. Okay? Thank you for doing that, Dare. Uh, anyways, getting back to those percentages and stuff. In the little gray rectangle at the bottom, Brittany, the little gray rectangle at the bottom of your grades page. Don't pay, and, and other places inside web courses, don't pay any attention to those because they're deceptive. And, and nobody at UCF knows how to uh, disable it and turn it off. I mean, it, it's one of those things, it's Canvas's way or the highway. I don't like it. And, you, and it used to be in the old Blackboard system. How are we doing? All right. Good. Can you get them squared away? All right. Yes. Uh, in the old Blackboard system, I could push anything into the grade book that I wanted. I mean, I could even put pictures in there. You know, I, would, you know, I could put a picture of a kitten or something like that in, in the grades page if I wanted to. But not in this modern Canvas system. All right, looking ahead for exam two, uh, let me just give you uh, a few words of advice uh, about getting ready for, especially if you're a little bit, you know, upset about your grade status right now. And don't forget, we're dropping the worst. If you take three, we drop the lowest, keep the best two. All right, and for many students, it's exam one. Simply because you don't know what my exams are like, and but but uh, but in exam two and exam three, you pretty much know how to get ready and you do better and stuff like that. Uh, anyways, participate in SI, of course, and take part in office hours if you can. Now here's Darien's office hour. It's Friday, right? Yep. At one at noon to one p.m. and she just meets in the atrium of the physical sciences building you know, where they have all those cafe tables and stuff like that. And she is great to work with. Um, and, of course, I have office hours Wednesdays, 1030 to noon in room 158. That's right next to uh, just adjoining the uh, atrium in the physical sciences building. All right. Uh, third suggestion, find a study partner. Uh, in other words, a human being uh, or a study group. Form a study group. And I know some of you have been trying to do that, uh, and if you if you haven't done that, it's worth trying to to do. And and now, if especially um, if you have a friend in class, or if you want to make a friend in class, uh, it's a good time to do it, and it's a good way to study. But please do not post uh, your phone number or email address in discussions. I'll take it down. And the two TAs will take it down if I don't. Uh, and simply because we don't want that kind of, for, for safety reasons. Uh, not that anybody in here is a maniac, but uh, just don't do it. All right. But try to organize yourselves uh, without doing uh, personal information and discussions. Okay. Uh, can you write down uh, any change in the grades? So all the, so, so all the data is correct. All right, good. Thank you for doing that. All right. Well, so if, so all the scantrons are squared away. So if we didn't get you at the beginning of class, we'll get you right, you know, at the end of class. And it'll be checked. Uh, third thing, uh, a fourth thing is, uh, Leverage the lecture video and, and to rework your notes, your, your classroom notes. And that is basically the secret method of Darianne. She is the one that really encourages that. And I, I believe it. I mean, I agree with it. It's a very good strategy. And then fifth, keep your eyes on my highlights uh, in the e-text. Figure out how to subscribe to them. And that will really help you out. And just in general, uh, you know, do follow Bruce Lee's advice. Be water, my friend. In other words, adapt to the situation and the terrain in which you find yourself, which happens to be this particular class. All right. Questions? Yes.
Um, the question was, can you come to office hours and discuss the clicker, clash, clicker questions um, and how to solve them? And the answer to that is yes, you can come. And you can come to office hours and talk about the price of tomatoes in China. I mean, anything that you want to talk about, I mean, within reason, is kosher. And uh, I don't have an agenda for office hours, and neither does Darianne. You know, we both have a lot of work to do. And we'll, I'll be doing my classwork. Darian will be studying uh, until a student comes, and then then we'll do whatever you want to talk about. And so that's and that's normal. That's something we do. The other thing is, a lot of times with a clicker question, a calculation or something, we'll actually go over it right after we do the clicker question. Hopefully, um, you know, explain it then. But if not, yeah, come to office hours. Either mine or Darian's. It's good. Brittany. You mean for the test clicker questions? The, the actual, the blurb that you actually have um, for the clicker questions on the exam, it is verbatim. And I have a little discussion about not just the answer, but how to get to the answer. So there's equations and plugins and stuff like that. So you'll be able to look at that. And if you still have questions, we can work it out in office hours. You know, but definitely look at that PDF first, print it out, and that'll be a nice little study guide. And here's, a, here's something that you want to remember. You know, the whole idea of taking an exam with me is to figure out if you understand the things that I think are important of all the millions of things that we could talk about every day. Of that stuff on the exam, the clicking questions are usually really important. In other words... Because I can give partial credit, and that's something I want to do, I won't just give you partial, you know, put clicking questions, you know, like how far can you run in five hours if you run at 10 miles an hour. I mean, that's so simple, I wouldn't put it, I just put that on Scantron. But if it's something juicy, like a free fall, or a stopping time, or stopping distance, or something like that, I'll probably be putting that on the clicking part, and... And therefore, you can know that that's an important thing that you want to know then and also for the final. Right, so, and you'll have a blurb. And they're verbatim. The, the regular part of the test, the Scantron part of the test, I don't normally publish. So the blurb files that you're going to see when I get them posted, uh, they're not going to be verbatim copies of the questions. Uh, now, the clicker blurb, yes, but not the Scantron blurbs. All right, let's talk about uniform circular motion. This is a little bit of chapter three that we saved uh, for after the test. The Nardo ring is an interesting test track in South Italy. Here's a picture of its location down in the boot heel uh, of, of Italy. Uh, here's a little bit of a close up. And what we're gonna talk about today uh, for the next mm, 35 minutes till we dismiss uh, is curved trajectories in general and then circular trajectories in specific. So, um, and the Nardo ring is a great example of a circular trajectory or things moving on the Nardo ring uh, are excellent examples of circular trajectories. But let's take a uh, curve path in general. So go ahead and sketch yourself kind of curvaceous path with a couple turns in it. Anything like that. And this path, if you're driving it in a car, you're going to have to use your steering wheel. It's not a straightaway. All right? So you're changing direction. And that means that you're changing the velocity arrow. And because you're changing the velocity arrow of your vehicle, that means that you're accelerating. So at any point on the track, there might be an acceleration. Because there's an acceleration, there's also a net force. And on a curved trajectory, we have a way of bookkeeping and keeping a track of the different kind of forces that you have to um, produce 
uh, and that you, the tires of your car, if you're driving it, have to produce in order to keep you on that path. At each point on a curve, there is a radius of curvature. Okay? In other words, a turning radius. If you go out to Daytona, you can look at uh, look up the specs for the Daytona Speedway, and they'll say, okay, for turn one and turn two, it's a radius of whatever it happens to be, 120 meters or something like that. And, and then turn three, if they're using turn three, uh, they'll tell you what the radius of curvature for that one is. All right, so what we're going to do, um, I'm going to choose a point up here on the curve, and I want you to kind of choose a point uh, right up about here if you want. And what we're going to do is figure out the radius of curvature and the velocity arrow at that point. And when we do that, we will automatically analyze the forces uh, on uh, this trajectory. All right, so let's go ahead and put a dot up here somewhere. Uh, and what we're going to do is sketch in uh, the velocity vector there and then the uh, radius of curvature or the circle um, from which we derive the radius of curvature. So first thing, you've got your point up there. Now draw in gracefully as you can a tangent line right through that point. Just gracefully, Delaney, touching the curve at just one point. Okay, so, so try your best. And I've, I've done mine really carefully at that point. That's that dashed line. Now the velocity vector is going to be parallel to that tangent line. The velocity is a tangent vector relative to the trajectory, relative to the curve. And so it's either going to be going up and to the right or down and to the left, depending on which way you're going through the racetrack. All right, so let's say that we're going in this direction. So tracing an arrow with its tail on that dot that you chose and its arrowhead going up and to the right. So let's say that we're going from the lower left of this curve all the way up to the upper right. And so at this point, I've got a velocity vector that's going to look something like that, Brittany. Okay. And so um, let's go ahead and label it V. And I'm going to put a little arrow over the top of it to symbolize we're really thinking hard about vectors now. All right. And... I'm going to take out my tangent line now. You Don't erase yours. You can keep it in, but I'm going to try to unclutter my diagram a little bit. All right, now, radius of curvature. That's next. Here's the... I've just got it kind of gracefully drawn in. It's not right on the point yet. I've, I've backed it away so you can see it. All right? Now, that circle... All right? For at least a short distance, that is right along the actual path. So if you're on a racetrack, that circle might be right on your path for a few meters of the racetrack. But if it's like Daytona, then, then I think most of the turns there are actually circular arcs, not full circles, of course, but, you know, like 100 degrees of a circle. 130 degrees, maybe, uh, for the circle. Uh, so quite a bit of the radius, or quite a bit of that uh, circle would be there. Now I'm going to back it up, and here it is. So that's what it, it would actually look like. Now because that is the case, you can't have any old circle. It's just got to be at r just the right point, and it's got to be tangent at that point on the trajectory. All right, so it, it matches the path for a few meters maybe. The center of this imaginary circle is on the inside of the turn. Now that's important, right? Because that's, that's the sense of curvature of the track. 
and the velocity vector here is tangent to both. It's tangent to the circle at that point, and it's tangent to the path. The path is not a circular path, but it's very close, at least for a few meters. It's fairly close to this circle. And then when you go a few meters down the, down the, down the road, you need an, a different circle, maybe a different curvature. You know, and, and, but this is just, this is like a snapshot for this one point on the track. This is what the circle uh, would look like. And one thing about this, the circular path has one radius of curvature. All right, now the track doesn't, this one doesn't anyways. It's got changing, because it, it gets really curvaceous right over here, at least on my diagram. It's tight, this is a really tight turn here, okay? And this one over here is a little bit uh, more gentle, so it has a bigger radius of curvature. But over here, this is a pretty tight radius of curvature, all right? So it, on a real track, uh, other than like a, a stock car track, so like uh, Formula One, you know, Formula One, they go kind of on a track with all different kinds of turns and stuff, and they'll have different radii of curvature as they go along the track. Um, but like the, an Indy, Indy car track, uh, it's just one radius of curvature. As long as you're in the turn, you have one radius. Same thing with Daytona stock car tracks. Plus there's banking and stuff like that, but that's a separate issue. All right, so there's our radius of curvature, this line segment between this circle of the imaginary, or excuse me, the center of the imaginary circle and the point where your vehicle is on the track. All right, now let's get a little bit more refined. Let's say that the speedometer as you go through this track is constant. In other words, let's say you go through at 10 miles an hour, nice and easy. All right, you could do that. You could put it on cruise control if you have cruise control in your vehicle. All right, and just put it on 10. And let's figure out what's going to happen with that situation. First, we know that the velocity vector is changing, but it's not getting faster. It's not getting slower. We're at the same speedometer rating, 10 miles per hour. So the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity. If it were slightly slanted toward vector v here, then it would be speeding up. If it were slanted um, slightly backwards from vector v, then you'd be slowing down a little bit. But if you're at constant speed, which is our assumption, number four, cruise control, then the acceleration vector is perpendicular to the velocity. Here it is. Go ahead and draw in your circle, uh, or go back to your circle that you've got, and type in a vector here perpendicular to the velocity. Now, if it's perpendicular to the velocity, and if its tail is at the same point as the velocity arrow, that acceleration is going to be perpendicular to the velocity, and it's going to point right back toward the center of the circle. Because a tangent line is perpendicular to the radius where it touches. Okay, so if you have a tangent line to a circle, okay, one of the radii is going to go right out to the tangent point. And that radius is perpendicular to the tangent line at that point only. And that's what we've got here. So the acceleration is along the imaginary radius of curvature at that point only. And so we would say that the acceleration points toward the inside of the turn. All right? You have to turn the steering wheel now, and your steering wheel is the thing that's causing the acceleration. No, not the gas, not the brakes, your steering wheel. 
and it changes only the direction of the velocity. Because remember, we're on cruise control at 10 miles per hour. Okay? So we're not changing the speed, and cars can do that. But what, what you do change is the direction of the velocity vector. So if you're a little bit further down the track, you know, like right here, where, look at where my cursor is. If you're right there on the track, look at it. Look up, look up, come on, look up. See where my cursor is? If that's your location, your velocity vector is going to be a different direction, but it's still going to be 10 miles per hour in length. All right? But different direction. And that's because you have um, these uh, changes in the direction um, directly toward the center of curvature of the track. Okay? Now, because there's an acceleration, there's going to be, or it is necessary that there be, a net force. Maybe a little bit, maybe quite a bit. And the amount of net force depends on a couple things. Okay? And if you think about it, you know, driving around, you know, the amount of The amount, you know, if, if you want to drive your car and your tires stay in contact with the road and you don't skid out or anything, you have to make sure you don't go too fast. So speed, whatever it happens to be, determines in part the amount of force, net force, that produces this acceleration. And then the other thing is you can go through... Um, a big turn at a high speed, but you can't go through a tight turn at a high speed. All right? So the radius of curvature, the tightness of the curve, also determines whether your net force is going to be a little bit or quite a bit. The net force is also toward the center of the turn. And basically, the net force is produced... Uh, by the grip uh, of your tires uh, on the surface of the road. So if you have some bald tires like this, you're not going to be able to go through very good turns. Right? You're going to have to slow down. You're going to have to slow down to granny speed. Right? But if you have some good tires like this, yeah, you can take it at a higher speed because you got more grip, you know. So those are the things, you know, the speed that you go through or, and or the um, tightness of the curve determines uh, how much uh, acceleration you've got to, to produce with a net force from these tires and from the, you know, the way that you steer, okay? All right, now questions about this before we continue. A lot of concepts here, and it's all geometry. Go ahead. Yeah, these ones, you can think of it this way. With the really good tires, you can take a tight corner at a higher speed without skidding out. Okay? Or if it's on a, a rainy, a, a, a wet road. You can, with good tires... You could take a turn at a higher speed. But if you have those other tires over there, if you try to take the same corner at the same speed, you're going to spin out. Because your tires are going to lose grip. You know, they don't have enough grip. All right. Another question. Alana. Yeah, that's an acceleration in red right here. Does that look red to you? It doesn't look red to me. But I don't know, I, I'm looking at it kind of at an angle here. Uh, but yeah, that's the acceleration. Yeah, Alana's asking if, if my acceleration vector were kind of tilted down into this direction here along the vector, still inward but a little bit with the vector, then yeah, you're making a turn and you're speeding up as you go. So this is, if you're speeding up through the turn, 
you're no longer perfectly perpendicular. All right? If you're slowing down through the turn, which you know sometimes you got to do, then it's it's backed away uh, from the from the uh, velocity vector, and you know sometimes you got to do that. So it just depends. But if you're on cruise control, this is what you get. All right. Now let's take a look at Nardo ring again. Here we go. Here's a close up. This is what it looks like from space. Here it is, right over here. Here's a little more close up, and you can see. See, here's a little test track, a little mini test track over here. Now this one over here, this little kind of squirrely looking thing, that is a zillion different radii of curvature. But the main ring itself, where they do most of the test driving, yeah, that's a perfect circle, as perfect as they could make it. It's pretty big too. These are clouds here. And these are shadows of the clouds. It's kind of cool looking. You can even tell what time of day it is by the slant of the, by the angle between the cloud and the ground. So there's the overhead view. So let's talk about the outermost lane. The outermost lane, the optimal speed is 149 miles per hour. And what I'm not giving you is the exact angle of banking. It, the, these are also banked. So they're banked sufficiently so that you can drive that entire ring at 149 miles an hour and with a straight steering wheel. Okay? And if you want to go a little bit faster than that, you have to crank the steering wheel uh, a couple degrees. All right? And now they have another track. Uh, you might be able to make it out. Um, they have another track, the innermost lane, banked differently. And this one's optimized for 50 mile an hour travel. So this is like for testing cargo trucks and stuff like that. You know, because like a, you know, a truck, you know, up there in Europe, they have these big auto bonds. And it used to be the case that there was no speed limit on the auto bond. Is that still... Yeah, outside the big cities, no. Sp yeah, no, Montana. I used to live in Montana, so we, you know, that was that was one of the, you know. And now they have speed limits in a lot of places in Montana, but the speeding ticket is five dollars. So it's it's so the feds forced them to put a speed limit up. So they said, okay, we'll put up a speed limit, and the ticket is only five dollars. Anyway. Um, so the so for passenger cars that are you know designed for autobahn, you know they, they want to be able to go up to 149, but cargo trucks you know 50. And on this one again, if you want to go a little faster, you have to put a little more crank on the steering wheel. But straight, you know, it just just cruise right on through. It's you know everything straight, uh, 50 miles an hour optimum speed. And the Narda ring. It's uh, used by a lot of different automakers, not just Fiat. Uh, I want to uh, derive some equations with you now, uh, and we're going to try to do this in the next 15 minutes. Uh, and we're going to derive two equations for uniform circular motion. And so now we're going to use we're going to use an idealized track. We're going to just idealize everything, you know, as if you know Nardo were a perfect circle, and you know. And so here we go. Uh, we're going to do uniform circular motion. Uh, that means constant speed on a circle. And we're going to look at two different instants of time. So. Here you are at instant of time t1, and here you are, you're going anti-clockwise, uh, and here you are at a later moment in time, you're up here uh, at about 2 o'clock, and you start over here at time t1 at about the 3 o'clock position, and a little bit later you're over here at the... And these two arrows here, the two red velocity arrows, uh, they're both the same size, uniform circular motion. 
All right, so this is cruise control, right? I'm not specifying, William de Klerk, uh, what the speed is, but whatever it is, the Vs are the same. The size of these arrows are the same, all right? Now, the radii are the same because this is, this is two snapshots. So this is like a snapshot of a, 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 you know, hovering in space above the Nardo ring and we're measuring the velocity of, you know, somebody's Porsche going around the ring, all right, at two different times. All right, now, go ahead and draw your radius out to the point and your velocity vector up here. And what I want to do now is kind of copy this one at time, the radius at time t2 over to this one. And then I'm going to kind of park them down here to the left. So try to do a copy um, tail to tail. And where those two line segments meet, that's the center of the circle. So this one up here is from T2, and this horizontal one is from time T1. Okay, so I just kind of copied them down here. All right. Now I want to do a similar copy of the two velocity vectors. Okay, so this red one at time T1, that's straight up. The location is 3 o'clock. So the ve velocity is perpendicular to the curve there, so therefore it's pointing straight up. Over here at 2 o'clock position, we got a little bit of tilt to the velocity arrow. So that's all right. We can kind of copy them. Here's my copy. And I'm just going to park it over here. All right, so kind of park yours over to the side here. All right, so just kind of eyeball on a couple copies. And those two arrows should be the same length. The two velocity arrows up here. And then these two babies, the two radii, like all radii, should be the same size. All right. Now, I'm going to shrink down my two circles, and, but I'm going to keep my, here are my two sets of vectors. Here's my two velocity vectors in red. Here's my two positional radii in black down here. And hey, you guys, if you think about it, the angle here, right here, um, is the same as the angle between these two velocity arrows up here, okay? Uh, so, and I believe that when I sketched this in, I took like an hour to get these diagrams right. This one is 30 degrees away. So I think this angle here is 30 degrees exactly. And that means that this one is 30 degrees exactly here. But no matter what the angle is, theoretically, they'll both be the same. So if they're 17 degrees apart, if I have a different instant of time, um, and this is 17 degrees down here for the two radii, then it'll be 17 degrees up here, but slightly different directions, but between the two velocity vectors, still 17 degrees. All right, now, go ahead and connect the dots, make a, right, make a isosceles triangle here from the two radii the two positional radii, and then do the same thing. Uh, actually, go ahead and label the two long sides, R and R. And that is why we call it an isosceles triangle, because two of the sides are the same length. Now, the dotted line segment uh, is not the same size, but that's all right. We want isosceles-ness, isosceles-ity, uh, which you get because it's a circle. Right? The radii are the same on a circle. Now, if it were an ellipse, you wouldn't have that, but a circle, yep. Same thing here. Uniform circular motion. Cruise control means that these two babies up here are the same size. So go ahead and connect tip to tip. All right, make an isosceles triangle, V and V, and that's because of cruise control, uniform circular motion. All right, and now this dotted line down here, this is the approximate distance that you travel. 
It's not the exact distance because the exact distance is along a circle. But it's fairly close. So this is an approximate, an approximation to the true distance. All right. This one up here is actually delta V. That's the change in the velocity. All right. From this one over to this one. All right. So that's the delta V. Now, I didn't put an arrow on that, but if I did, it would be to the left in this diagram. On this dashed line, delta V would be to the left. I'm leaving my arrowhead off there so my diagram doesn't get too uh, cluttered up. Now, let me pause for questions. We want to do this and do it really carefully. Alana. How do I know that it goes? Uh, the question up here, uh, how do I know delta V goes to the left? The reason I know that is delta V was like this, straight up, and it became like this, and so the change is to that direction. So what that, another way to think about it is you got to crank your steering wheel this way. All right? Brittany, question. Here? Like how we made those? I made these, I made two identical circles, and then I made a radius here, mm -hmm. and then I took the same radius and I copied it over here, and then I twisted it 30 degrees. Okay. And then I said, okay, that's where I am at some later time, T2. And then everything else is based on that decision that I made to make it 30 degrees of the circle at and some later time. And that's where you, yep, and so those are the, so these are shrink downs of these two radii. And then what, what about the other one? Velocities. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So those are velocities. Good. Another question before we continue. Yeah. Delta V is what? They're not. I didn't make them equal length. They're going to be, those are, the question was, are the approximate distance segment, the black dashed line, and the delta V segment, are they going to be the same size? Answer, no. You can't compare them. One is the distance, one is the speed. Or a velocity. So, and I didn't make them the same size either. Okay. I tried not to make them the same size. Uh, and so they could be, you know, this one could be 10 times bigger. And, we, and everything that we're about to do would still work. All right. So there's no, they, actually they do kind of look similar in size, but they're, they're not. And they could be way different sizes. And all the logic that we apply would still apply. It'd just be a, It'd just be a, uh, a difficult diagram to show, that's all. Question. Yep, angles are the same. So this one I chose to be, Brittany, I chose this one to be 30. Okay, that's the one I started with. And that automatically means that these guys change by 30 degrees. As long as they're, per if, if they're perpendicular to the radii, then you have 30 here, you get 30 over here. All right, now. These two triangles are similar. All right, now that's a technical geometry term, similar triangles. That means that the angles are equal and the sides are proportional. So if I make a ratio of isosceles side to isosceles side of the other triangle, that'll be the same as base to base, uh, for instance. And we're actually going to use that. So we have proportionality, but and that's all geometry. That's all mathematics. That's Pythagoras and those cats, you know, 2,500 years ago. This is the key to the physics understanding. This 
being approximately V delta T is how we're going to get an equation for an acceleration and for a force. All right, now, I said that these two triangles, the velocity triangle up here, the red one, and I'm going to call that the velocity triangle, and then this black one down here, that's the position triangle, right? They're proportional. That means they have the same basic shape. You know, one might be, uh, what's your name again with the yellow shirt, yellow sleeves? Michelle. Michelle. As Michelle was saying about the sizes, they could be different sizes, but they have the same shape. You know, if you line them up, you know, they would overlap if you, if you line them at the, at the right distances. All right. Now, that being the case, the ratio between the radius and the velocity, the isosceles sides, will be equal to the, ra the ratio between this approximate distance, V delta T, and delta V itself. And that ratio looks like this. Here it is. R divided by V. Okay. And V delta T over delta V. All right. Now, V delta T, R and V, this is the isosceles stuff. All right. This is the isosceles. So position triangle divided by speed triangle. The isosceles sides, that's this stuff. Now this one over here, this is the base of the isosceles triangle. So V delta T, that's the base over here for the position triangle. And then delta V, that's the base up here of the velocity triangle. Right? So we go base to base, and then isosceles to isosceles, or long side to long side. And that, my wonderful students, is the proportion. And because I feel like dismissing right now, I'm going to dismiss and hand out exam printouts up here. And I hate to say it, but I'm not going to give you any homework tonight. Sorry. I know that bums you out, but dismissed. I'll see you on Friday. Uh, see you on Thursday. No homework. Can you turn the light on?